Welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel at NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's webinar called Beyond Polarization, Learning from the Unlikely Story of California's Marine Protected Areas. And we've got two great speakers for you today. I will introduce them in a moment. Um, first, I just want to thank our partners in this webinar series, Octo and EBM Tools Network. Um, and as I think many of you know who've participated in these, we're going to have a presentation and then we will have plenty of time for Q&A and questions and comments that you may have. So please use the comments box to um, go ahead and put your questions in there and we will get to those after the speakers have uh, finished their presentations. And as always, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the Open Channels website. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, Steve Yaffe from the University of Michigan School of, for Environment and Sustainability, and Caitlin Gaffney from the Resources Legacy Fund. Steve Yaffe is a professor of natural resources and environmental policy at the University of Michigan. For more than 40 years, he had worked on policies promoting large-scale conservation and ecosystem management, as well as the design and management of collaborative decision-making approaches. He is the author or co-author of six books, including a 2000 classic co-authored with Julia Wandela, Making Collaboration Work, and a 2017 book that explored 12 case studies of marine ecosystem-based management in North America. Today's presentation builds off his latest book, Beyond Polarization, Public Process and the Unlikely Story of California's Marine Protected Areas, now available from Island Press or Amazon. Dr. Yaffe received his PhD in environmental policy and planning from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he's also a former professor of mine. Uh, Caitlin Gaffney is the Ocean, Coast, and Fisheries Program Director at the Resources Legacy Fund, or RLF. It is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that works closely with philanthropists to advance conservation of land, ocean, and water resources, climate change resilience, and conservation funding and policies, and was the philanthropic partner to the state of California during the Marine Life Protection Act initiative that led to the establishment of the state's MPA network. Over the past eight years, Caitlin has managed a philanthropic pooled fund that helps to support stewardship of California's Marine Protected Area Network. Before joining RLF, she was the Pacific Program Director for Ocean Conservancy, where she served on the Marine Life Protection Act Central Coast Regional Stakeholder Group and the North Central Coast Statewide Interest Group. She also represented conservation interests on the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council for eight years. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our speakers uh, and we'll start with you, Steve. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Uh, and thanks to Sarah Carr and the organizers from the EBM Tools Network and the other uh, sponsors. Um, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what was, um, after more than 10 years of hard work, a successful effort to designate and implement uh, marine protected areas in California state waters. And central to its success was the creation of a unique public-private partnership involving the California philanthropic community and California state agencies. Um, the partnership in turn built a broad coalition of stakeholders, scientists, and policymakers, and created a process that managed a huge amount of conflict. And in a time when polarization appears to be a daily fact of life, in case you've noticed, um, the MLPA story, the Marine Life Protection Act story, really provides, I think, a counter narrative uh, where a set of really diverse people came together and succeeded in accomplishing something big. Uh, and they did it in spite of public sector fiscal crisis and in spite of seemingly irreconcilable conflicts, some in involving some fundamental issues around tribal sovereignty and justice issues and others. A uh, lot of hard work, uh, but I think it actually is a, a, a hopeful story uh, given our times. Our presentation, Caitlin, and my presentation, um, today are going to briefly answer these five questions. Um, so what did the process accomplish? Uh, why, do, why do I call the process unlikely? So why does success unlikely? Uh, what enabled uh, progress? How did the partnership shift uh, business as usual when business as usual was not good enough? 
Um, and how has the implementation activities since the designations ended in 2012, how did, have they built on the foundation of the designation process? Um, and as Lauren mentioned, my comments draw on research and writing that I've been carrying out over the last seven years, which is summarized into, in a new Island Press book titled Beyond Polarization. And it really tells the story of the process in the words of its participants and tries to identify some lessons for comparable processes. So I'm going to tell you the end of the story first. Uh, and it's probably a, an image that some of you have. Uh, 124 marine protected areas of different kinds of levels of protection. They were established. They are these colored dots up and uh, down the California coast. All told, 16% of state waters, 852 square miles of scattered habitat patches, but designed as a network whose parts were intended to interact with each other, which makes it fairly unique in the panoply of MPA systems um, out there. Um, and there are some pretty spectacular places among these patches uh, that are now being branded and uh, used as underwater wilderness, underwater parks. And not just MPAs were created. Uh, for a state that had never figured out how to deal with tribes as something other than a stakeholder group, uh, which was an insulting uh, term and image to the tribes, um, the process resulted in policy and organizational changes that recognize the sovereign and unique status of tribes. And Caitlin will tell you more about this. The process moved through four sequential regional planning processes starting in 2004 and ending in 2012. And to enable the stakeholders to collectively design a network, they needed user-friendly uh, GIS, geographic information system-based decision support tools. And from that need came development of some pretty innovative tools uh, such as Marine Map and SeaSketch. An extensive monitoring education network has been created after the designations involving citizens and collaborative groups up and down the coast. And the process has also helped to trigger organizational change um, in state agencies, which involved updating and expanding expertise, uh, evolving at least somewhat from a fisheries biology to an ecosystem ecology frame. And I think that emblematic of that transformation was a shift in the name from the Cal Department of Fish and Game to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now it's easy to look backwards from 2020 and see a situation as a given. Hindsight is 2020. But from the vantage point of 2003, it was incredibly unlikely that this effort would come to fruition. The state had already failed twice. The MLPA, the Marine Life Protection Act, had passed in 1999. Uh, it required the state to act. And in their first attempt, a uh, state convened panel of scientists drafted a map with no stakeholder input. And not surprisingly, all hell broke loose when they shared it. So then they, move on and they created seven parallel regional stakeholder processes and then ran out of money and willpower after two meetings were held of each of those processes. So trying to find the balance between too cold and too hot uh, was tough. And by 2003, the effort was just about dead. The issue of marine reserves is full of seemingly intractable conflict with really well entrenched political interests, uh, commercial fishing versus sport fishing, fishing versus conservation. In California's waters, um, much of the coast, they was seen as property owned by a current set of users. And to set aside any of that as reserves would be a major battle. Plus, um, sport fishing is a big uh, money-making business that politically aspires to be as organized as the National Rifle Association. 
Um, and new set-asides would really create a bad precedent um, for other places away from California. The MLPA was signed in 1999 at the end of the tech bubble, which burst five months later, and California suffered a recession through 2003, which then bogged down the MLPA process. Uh, the process finally gets some traction in 2004 and was at the end of a second regional effort and the beginning of a third, right when Lehman Brothers failed in 2008. Not the best timing here. The California economy went off the cliff. Uh, the MLPA was a law pushed by Democratic legislators from coastal districts and signed by Democratic Governor Gray Davis. But its implementation required support from Republican Arnold Schwarzenegger and his administration, setting up a potentially partisan battle uh, for the orphan MLPA process. And many things were not known about MPAs in the early 2000s. No one had put into place enough monitoring and evaluation to determine what benefits they actually produced. So in many ways, it was unlikely that the process would get resurrected once killed, let alone succeed um, quite well. So what accounts for success, um, you might be wondering. Well, first, the law was framed as non-discretionary. In facilitation, we distinguish between whether questions and how questions, whether new MPAs should be created versus how should we determine which should get created and what their design should be. It's not a question of yes or no, it's what the design um, should look like. And the MLPA, in this case, settled the weather question. It said that there would be MPAs designated. And while fisheries interests tried to relitigate whether, whether new MPAs were needed throughout the first regional process, uh, their arguments could be set aside because the leadership of the process kept reminding opponents that, quote, the law uh, makes us do it this way. Among other features of the law, ecosystem protection was a clear priority. Minimizing economic impacts was not required which also limited the power of opponents of MPAs. Minimizing economic impacts was a political need, but it was not a legal requirement. The designers, so here's a second factor. The designers of the process also created a really unique structure that not only convened regional stakeholder processes that were advised by science panels, scientific advisory panels, which is sort of a normal part of collaborative processes, but they added an additional piece, and that is they created a policy level blue ribbon task force, in the, which is in the middle of this diagram, uh, to serve as an intermediary between the stakeholder process and the California Fish and Game Commission, who was and continues to be the decider here. And not only did it insulate both sides from each other, but it provided uh, pre-negotiated proposals to the commission, which then made them hard to ignore, or hard to, um, for them to take seriously, not, not to take seriously. They also forced scientists out of their comfort zone and required them to simplify what they usually present as extraordinary, extraordinarily complex systems. Uh, rules of thumb enable the stakeholders to apply a set of size and spacing guidelines to MPA designation. And armed with those rules, which were eight commandments uh, here, eight elements around size and spacing and habitat representation and some other things, but armed with those rules, they could then individually and collectively design their own uh, networks. Um, which then enabled engagement and enabled ownership beyond what is usually possible when you have uh, stakeholders simply providing information to a set of experts or a set of GIS analysts who would then feed back a solution. And along the way, a set of credible scientists emerged who could communicate with policymakers and with lay people 
um, who could simplify their message for human consumption. These are the, the Dr. Fauci's of, of the MLPA process, I guess. But really impressive uh, translation from what is usually seen as really complicated systems and networks of interactions to pretty simple rules of thumb uh, that the stakeholders could apply to network design. The process benefited also from the mandate in the law to use best readily available science, um, which cut down the opponent's ability to filibuster based on simply demanding for more and more information because all that was required is really all that's often available and that's best readily available science. Uh, the backgrounds of the process were able to secure the support of Governor Schwarzenegger through trusted intermediaries, um, in part because the MLPA had teed up a series of tangible wins, which for an individual who craved action um, was a legacy um, that he could own. And getting the process done within Schwarzenegger's eight years became a constant refrain. Um, because the organizers of this and the supporters of MPAs recognize the importance of political will and are never quite sure what happens after a leader had embraced this process and a new leader takes over, a new governor would take over. Having $35 million in private philanthropic money from the Packard, Moore, and other uh, foundations certainly didn't hurt. Um, but it's really what that money went to that's what's really critical here and transformative. Um, that level of support enabled them to invest in good process, process matters, um, and they contracted with really good facilitators who had lots of tools at their disposal. They used deadlines to keep the parties moving forward. The stakeholder process was set up to produce alternatives, options, not a consensus which was an important uh, decision up front, because it, then it made it likely that all stakeholders could support one of the alternatives and no one could ultimately block or veto um, a consensus choice. Now you can imagine a collaborative problem solving process is going through these four stages that are listed here from sort of getting started through introductions and agenda setting, through a robust process of identifying and exploring issues, um, through efforts to generate options and evaluate them, and then finally to creating packages that incorporate trade-offs. And the facilitators move through a, this very deliberate stepwise process, adapting over time, making mistakes at time, recovering at time, um, but changing uh, according to the conditions and to the conditions of the specific regions, the four different regions where it was appropriate. They use the process of creating ground rules and drafting objectives as a way to define the boundaries of the problem and potential solutions. And then to show participants that they could work together and reach consensus, at least on those items. And that was important. Some of it's sort of pro forma in a collaborative process, but it became really important in this case because it, it allowed for the, the sort of creation of a proxy for the party's underlying conflicts. That is that during the discussion of ground rules and goals of objectives, particularly in the first regional process, there was an airing of grievances that allowed the Sort of bad feelings to at least come out and be exposed and be acknowledged and emotions be acknowledged ahead of the real work of MPA designation. The facilitators constantly tried to frame the process in a productive way, they describing it as a mutual gains seeking effort, um, sort of a win-win seeking approach, describing the process of creating draft MPAs as, as a brainstorming effort that involved, quote, inventing without committing, um, reminding the parties of what would happen if they did not reach agreement. This is an important element. Uh, this is their BATNA, their best alternative to a negotiated agreement for those familiar with negotiation terminology. 
um, but constantly reminding what would happen if the stakeholders could not negotiate on their own, that they would get elevated to the Blue Ribbon Task Force or the Game and Fish Commission, both of which the stakeholders didn't trust to make the choice, incentivize them to try to stay at the table and work things out. Sometimes this worked, sometimes not, but at times it created a much more productive interchange than if the process was viewed in the way that the stakeholders initially saw it, um, which was as a zero sum sort of win-lose situation. A major amount of time was spent on collaborative learning where extensive presentations and opportunities for discussion were provided to build an informed understanding of the science and the multiple values at stake in the many different places along the California coast. And if nothing else, and I've watched uh, many, many hundreds of hours of, of public meetings and then talked to people afterwards, but this led to a dialogue that exhibited a level of understanding of facts and values at stake that is just really rare um, today. As many as 64 stakeholder representatives were at the table, which those of you that facilitate processes will tear your hair out when hearing that. Um, so the facilitators had to manage all that complexity. They used subgroups for a lot of the work. And one of the things they did quite explicitly was they designed cross-interest work groups to pre-negotiate MPA designs and potential agreements. And in many places, they were very successful in, in moving the dialogue away from positional to more integrative bargaining. To reach resolution, uh, well, the existence in the later regions of a user-friendly collaborative GIS system really was transformative. It enabled individual stakeholders to try out MPA concepts, and then the collective group to focus on a projected map and make adjustments in real time. And it, it really is amazing to watch late in, these, in, the, in each of these processes when you see 100 people in a, meet, in a hotel meeting room all studying two different uh, images shared on a screen of the same MPA and different designs to watch them focus on that and adjust it accordingly. Uh, it helped shift the dialogue from conflict across the table to a set of people focused on a shared problem. And that tool really was very po powerful, um, particularly as it developed effectively in the third and fourth regions. To reach resolution, the facilitators used a variety of polling techniques, which helped to bring closure to debate over options. Uh, polling was useful in, in part because this was not a consensus process, but one that sought, quote, substantial agreement was their ground rule. Of course, if you poll, you need to worry about the balance of numbers among different stakeholder groups. And in the South Coast in particular, an imbalance toward the consumptive groups, the fishing groups, enabled their domination of the process. As a criticism, there was an extraordinary amount of process which was overpowering and exhausting at times, which tended to give power to those leading the effort. And sometimes they erred on providing much too much information, which cut into deliberation time. Still, as someone who studies collaborative process, these efforts were run, I would say, just about as well as they could be. Now, a few of these things would have happened without the unique public-private partnership established by the initiative. $35 million is a lot of money, but the partnership was not just about money and not just about funding a process. All organizations create SOP, standard operating procedures. They need them to function. We have standard operating procedures to create standard operating procedures. But those SOPs limit flexibility, they limit creativity, and one of the great values of the initiative was to bust through some of the problematic existing SOPs. Unlike the normal bureaucratic situation, contracts could be turned around in days, funds could be shifted to where needed. Achieving the process was the objective, not carrying out preset organizational procedures. And the same was true with the funders. 
the initiative bundled funding from four different foundations, uh, RLF, uh, Caitlin's uh, organization, then put together a regranting program aimed at achieving the goals of the initiative. You know, for, in for individual foundations, giving up control over their money was not ordinary behavior, but enabled a much better and a more flexible and strategic program. The partnership also recognized the reality of collaborative processes, that they are layered within a context of political dynamics. It looks like this slide here. Process is always surrounded by politics, and RLF invested in building a supportive politics. They invested in media work, they invested in polling, they invested in outreach to county commissioners, um, they made a range of grants to organizations inside and outside the process to build capacity to enable them to participate and they made a range of grants to build the information base and the tools needed for the process to succeed the funders also clearly wanted something for their money um, where agency success is often defined as spending your budget so that you get more money in the next cycle uh, the funders wanted to see impact. They wanted to see a process that would end with a network of MPAs in place. And that interest drove a remarkable amount of adaptive learning throughout the effort. Uh, and it's one of the reasons the four regional efforts were run sequentially. Each process was evaluated. The next was designed considering those lessons as well as the unique conditions of the next place. The funders also invested millions in a range of implementation activities because they understood that creating a policy does not by itself ensure its implementation. And I think Caitlin's going to describe some of that in a few minutes. Now, private interests funding public choices is something we usually worry about. In this case, the partnership and the public process were fairly well firewalled. No minimum amount acreage of uh, reserves was prescribed. The staff did not take their direction from the funders. The initiative went overboard in assuring transparency, recording, simulcasting all meetings, extensive documentation, many, many ways for people to provide comment, hours and hours of public comment and organized comment. But the bottom line is that through extraordinary effort, a lot of attention to process, engagement of scientists, stakeholders, and decision makers, California gained uh, what I believe, and I hope people believe on the ground, they gained a significant legacy. And not the least of that should be a sense that disputing parties can come together, together and collectively solve a problem, which I think is an important message uh, in today's times. I was sitting here the last few mornings um, stuck in pandemic isolation um, and thinking about, well, how does the MLPA story, how does the process relate to the situation today? And I came up with three simple messages just to kind of provide into this before I turn it over to Caitlin. Um, and the first is, is that science matters. Uh, it enables us to define a problem. It enables us to provide options and guidelines for solving the problem based on facts and what our best guess is about the future. Uh, second, process matters. Uh, it matters in providing an organized, coordinated, uh, inclusive and effective decision-making process and an implementation structure that is efficient and effective but it's also inclusive and participatory so that people and organizations own the solutions and might follow through on them. And thirdly, people matter. Uh, none of this happens without well-motivated and capable people. Uh, you need champions, you need creative and strategic thinkers, you need energizers, you need deal makers, you need doers to make progress. Uh, and I think that they need to be rewarded, they need to be protected and valued as some of our finest natural resources. So science, process, and people matter. I believe these things are true in managing marine resources 
And I think they're equally true in effectively managing world crises like a pandemic. Each element is important, and this is, this is important. None works without the others. You need all three of those uh, to be successful in moving forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin. Um, uh, but I wanna note that if you wanna learn more about the MLPA process, um, you can read about it in great detail. Um, my book, Beyond Polarization, Public Process and the Unlikely Story of California's Marine Protected Areas is listed on Amazon and Island Press's sites. And if you use the promo code webinar on the Island Press site, you'll get 30% off, uh, which is probably a pretty good deal. Uh, but the book does draw dialogue from the public meetings and from about 150 hours of interviews with a variety of participants so that my hope was to tell this as a story. It is a story of a piece of policy, which is kind of a strange wonky thing, but it is a story with personalities and tensions uh, and resolutions. It's a long narrative, but I, I hope it, it, you'll see it as an analytic one that focuses on the strategic choices made by facilitators and process leaders and what their effects were, were both good and bad. And just while I'm here, I just want to highlight another tool that we built along the way to help anyone understand um, collaborative processes better. And this is a website about collaborative public decision making, where what we did was to extract video clips from the MLPA initiative, from all the facilitation that went on there. Uh, and we organized them along the line of about 80 different facilitation tasks and challenges so that we provide some bullet point uh, lessons about them and people can watch uh, a facilitator generally or stakeholders actually doing the task. So I invite you to use it and the web address is here. Caitlin's gonna highlight these at the end, other ways to sort of learn more about it at the end of her talk so that you'll see these links again uh, while we're answering questions. So thank you for listening. Presumably you're still out there and I will turn it over to Caitlin. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I'm making Caitlin presenter, yep. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for <clears throat> that terrific um, introduction and description of the extraordinarily comprehensive um, book that that Professor Yaffe has um, produced. I, I hope everyone will get a copy um, and, and, and read it. It provides truly a comprehensive account of the 13 year effort that led to completion of the first statewide MPA network um, in the US in December of 2012. Um, and while completing the MPA design phase was certainly a major feat, it was also only the beginning. Around the world, there are many, many examples of conservation campaigns, both on land and in the ocean, where victory was declared at the time the protected area was established in law. This kind of mission accomplished mentality has led to what have been dubbed paper parks, areas that lack the attention and investment needed to actually meet their conservation goals over time. So my goal today is to describe for you how California has heeded those lessons and committed significantly to ongoing management to ensure that its MPA network is effective over time, and also to describe how some of the factors that were key to the successful completion of the MPA network have also been critical in the implementation stage. But first, I want to take us back in time to one specific day nearly exactly 10 years ago, and highlight one of the stories covered in Steve's book. It was July 21st, 2010. The North Coast Blue Ribbon Task Force was meeting in Fort Bragg, California to discuss the MPA planning for the Northern region of the state. California's North Coast is remote, it's rural, historically economically dependent on timber and commercial fishing, more recently on cannabis cultivation, it's also the area of California with the largest number of Native American tribes, the largest remaining tribal population, and where tribal communities remain deeply, deeply tied to the coast. And on that day in 2010, 
members of many Northern California tribes convened in Fort Bragg, literally marching in the street, from toddlers to grandmas and everyone in between, chanting, waving signs, and filling the Blue Ribbon Task Force meeting room to express the most serious concerns that the state effort to create new marine protected areas would harm or destroy their cultural and ceremonial practices and their traditional subsistence fishing and gathering. It was the most challenging and in my view, perhaps the most important day in the entire eight year process to establish marine protected areas in California. Prior to colonization, there were over 400 distinct tribes in California inhabiting the entire state and the whole coastline and actively stewarding a wide range of habitats and species using practices that had been developed and honed for more than 14,000 years as documented by Western science literally since time immemorial. The marine protected area planning process brought to head more than 160 years of injustice and conflict between the state of California and Native American tribes, including displacement of communities and theft of ancestral territories. Steve talked about the many factors that made success in the MLPA initiative unlikely, and I would put this long and complex history at the top of that list. And yet somehow, as part of the alchemy of the MLPA initiative, the past 10 years has seen a growing effort to begin to address some of these very serious problems. Upon taking office in 2019, Governor Newsom issued a formal state apology for the history of violence and discrimination against Native Americans. And while all of the details are more than we can get into here today, I would encourage you um, to, to delve into some of the, the background here in Steve's book. Um, and also there's an article that came out in the American Indian Law Review Journal. It was published last December that gets into many of the details of this important component of the story. Turning now to some of the um, general factors that have been so important to implementation of the State Marine Protected Area Network, um, I want to circle back to a point that Steve made time and time again around the critical importance of partnership. This was fundamental to the planning stage, designing the marine protected areas, um, and has also been critical in implementation. Starting, of course, with the public-private partnership that Steve described that provided philanthropic support to help fund many of the efforts in the design phase. Um, and that has, again, continued into implementation. The organizations shown here, the logos of the organizations shown here um, are uh, organizations that participate in a formal partnership um, called the Marine Protected Area Statewide Leadership Team. There's a recognition in California that effectively managing MPAs um, is not only a challenging task, but it's one that requires the input and engagement of multiple state, federal agencies, and other partners. Um, it's not simply a task that can be accomplished uh, by one agency. That said, I will highlight uh, some of the logos here at the top, the Fish and Game Commission, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and California Ocean Protection Council as the three sort of primary lead agencies supported by the efforts of many of these other organizations. Um, and these organizations work together to coordinate efforts around management um, and to track progress over time. Also wanted to mention um, one particular partnership. Uh, this is a, a California innovation that came out of the marine protected area planning process. And Steve talked about the high level of stakeholder engagement in MPA design. Um, and there was you know, such a keen interest from so many diverse parties in the MPA creation that has carried forward into the management stage. This organization, the MPA of Collaboratives, they're essentially county-based organizations um, that provide an opportunity for local citizens, community members, business owners, fishermen, uh, tribal representatives to participate in day-to-day -day management um, issues related to MPAs. So, for example, the collaboratives identify areas where you know, there are poaching hotspots. Um, they help develop materials that are focused on meeting local needs and addressing local audiences um, and engage in many, many other ways. Just as the MPA design process was you know, sort of quite formal and organized in its approach, um, California has taken very seriously uh, the need to have a comprehensive and coordinated management plan um, and process for management. 
So in 2016, the state officially adopted what they call the Marine Protected Area Master Plan um, that includes the four component areas it, you see highlighted here. Um, and since that time has adopted two separate three-year work plans that detail kind of the more specific actions, outcomes, deadlines, um, and assign tasks to the various agency and external partners to make sure that management is actually moving forward um, in effective and measurable ways. Of course, enforcement is one critical component of making sure that the you know any protected area is effective over time. You know, California has a thousand miles of coastline, 36 million people and growing. Um, and 124 marine protected areas. So ensuring that folks know the rules and regulations and follow them is um, no simple task. Um, and the state does face compliance challenges um, in, in some areas. The primary responsibility for enforcement of the marine protected areas lies with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, but there are many, many partners that also help to ensure MPA compliance from park rangers, the national and state and county parks, to local sheriffs um, and even lifeguard departments. Um, also shown here in the, in the center is a, a, it's a shore-based radar system. California is experimenting with use of new technologies or applying old technologies in new ways uh, to try to essentially provide um, you know, tools that can be used by law enforcement to provide a more efficient um, and hopefully effective approach to ensuring compliance. So the shore-based radar can sort of assess what level of vessel traffic is occurring within the marine protected area, um, and in theory, provide a signal that can show if there's suspicious activity that then law enforcement might want to follow up on. Just one example of some of the innovative tools that are being applied in California. Of course, also critical to compliance um, is just getting the word out, making sure that people know about the marine protected areas. There has been a huge amount of um, effort and investment made in California on this front, starting with philanthropic investment um, back in the early days. And then in more recent years, um, the state has really taken uh, uh, taken over responsibility for much much of this work, um, but this is you know ranges from the sort of on the ground signage as you see here. We have signs up and down the coast, um, both at public access points and viewpoints like this one, but also at um, harbors and other areas where fishermen um, may be entering the water and need to know what the rules are. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of effort to develop materials and curriculum and programs to meet uh, the needs of various audiences, again, from the fishing community to children's coloring books shown here. Steve also talked about the critical role of science in the design process, um, and California has remained very focused and committed um, to research, monitoring, the science of marine protected areas investing in both baseline monitoring at the time the marine protected areas first went into the water in each of the regions um, and then also in um, longer term monitoring projects designed to assess change over time so this is just an example of some of the projects that are underway right now um, and i would emphasize again here the value of partnerships the critical role of partnerships um, with academic institutions but also with the fishing community on cooperative um, monitoring projects with community science, as Steve mentioned, um, from reef check volunteers doing scuba diving to uh, programs that involve school children. Um, so a tremendous amount of work being done on the research and monitoring um, side of things. And this is meant to feed into the adaptive management of California's MPA network. So Steve talked about how learning and adaptation were part of the design phase. Um, also, part of the longer term management and implementation. The idea being that every 10 years, California will take a hard look at its marine protected area network, looking at the science and research that's available, taking input from stakeholders, uh, working with its partners um, in, in agencies and beyond, um, and deciding whether changes are needed in the management programs or even in the marine protected areas themselves. Um, so the first of these decadal reviews will be coming up just in a couple of years, 2022, a lot of planning underway now um, for that effort. 
So before I wrap up, um, I wanted to circle back for just a minute. Um, this photo was taken in March of this year, just a few months ago, um, and literally just a few days before the COVID pandemic made an in-person meeting and a group photo like this seem so, so dated already. Um, the group shown here includes state resource managers, tribal leaders and tribal staff, um, and other partners. And they had gathered over a couple of days to plan a tribal Marines Stewards Network pilot project um, with the goal of supporting tribal capacity related to ocean and coastal stewardship and monitoring. And one month ago, um, the California Ocean Protection Council voted unanimously to fund this project for the next couple of years with the goal of expanding it statewide in the future. Um, so I just wanna close you know, with, with a bit of hope. Um, certainly we have a long way to go and much still to learn, but I think California's more than 20 year efforts on marine protected area design and implementation have contributed to the state of knowledge um, and innovations in conservation, science, technology, and even in social justice. There has been a lot of interest in what California has done. You know, we at our left have talked to folks and shared information with colleagues in Chile, Hawaii, British Columbia, Indonesia, and China just in the last year. Uh, I know the state has, California has had um, many similar conversations with partners around the world. Um, and we have pulled together some of the lessons um, that seem the most salient in some publications that are available on our website. I have the link here, show one of those documents. Um, and then again, as Steve mentioned, um, here's the information again for getting a copy of Beyond Polarization and also the University of Michigan video um, resources. So thank you. I'm sure Steve and I will be happy to answer questions. All right, thanks so much, Steve and Caitlin. And I can see that several folks have gone ahead and put some questions into the question box. So please, I encourage other listeners to go ahead and submit your questions and we'll do our best to get through them. Uh, and I would just say that uh, because this is such uh, a broad, wide-ranging topic that you all have covered, there are a lot of broad, wide-ranging wide questions. So uh, feel free to also reference other organizations if these get into detail that you're not familiar with. Um, so Nancy Crusoe asks about restoration. And I think a couple of these questions have to do with the changing conditions of the California ocean. She mentions that um, restoration is not really addressed in the State Marine Conservation Area Code, and it's a, an oversight and has caused problems uh, following the Santa Barbara oil spill in 2015 and with the collapse of kelp forests in Monterey and further north uh, that have caused uh, difficulties in conducting restoration. Uh, and either of you able to comment on that? Well, I, I certainly, depends on the restoration effort, I would say. Um, you know, the marine protected area regulations are quite strict. Um, and so, you know, if you're planning a project that's within a state marine protected area, um, there is going to be significantly greater attention paid to that project um, and, you know, desire to ensure that there are no unintended consequences associated with the, with the effort. Um, that said, there are restoration projects that are occurring within marine protected areas, so it's not it's not that it can't be done, um, but certainly the bar is high. And on a related topic, Thomas Baker asks about the urchin barrens that are expanding in central and northern California, and uh, noting that no regulatory body has responded to this emerging threat. And are there um, problems with the design of MPAs or um, other challenges that are are not allowing action on this problem so the issue with urchin bearings is not specifically a marine protected area issue at all it is an issue that is uh, facing you know large areas of the california coast including areas that you know it contain marine protected areas um, and the state is actually taking this very, very seriously. This, both the state and federal agencies with ocean jurisdiction have been uh, taking this very seriously, have convened groups of scientists and advisors 
um, and are working right now on projects that are designed to try to test what might be um, effective mechanisms for trying to address that problem. It is a it is a complex problem um, and one that doesn't lend itself, unfortunately, to easy answers. But there are uh, test projects underway right now in Northern California that are looking at the potential efficacy of removing urchins. The, the problem is the scale of the uh, urchin issue is so large that it's very hard to develop a, a plan that um, you know that's likely to be effective in the short term. Uh, but I would say that the state and federal agencies are taking this very seriously and are working very diligently to try to address this crisis. Great. Um, and I would add a sort of different note, and this is thinking about the designation process, that I think one of the reasons the designation process was successful is that it actually teed up a complicated but a, a relatively straightforward problem to be solved. And that is sort of what boundaries uh, do you put about around chunks of water um, in order to achieve a network protection. What the process was not able to do and um, what it would have been burdensome to do is to solve all the associated other issues affecting marine resources. Um, water quality issues were dealt with somewhat in the way that uh, MPA boundaries were set, but not really. Um, and all the other issues around uh, take and energy development, you've got such a complicated layering of issues. Um, and if a, the process at this scale, tried to deal with those altogether, it would have failed under under the burden of all of that. So I think it's a it's a challenge, and when it's one of the reasons we have layers of institutional processes from federal planning and around fisheries and each fisheries and you know the state planning and local land use uh, work, et cetera. But it points to how complex these are um, and how. To solve them, I think at some times you have to kind of break them down into pieces, but it's unsatisfying in doing so. Thanks. And I would just add that regarding the topic of restoration, uh, Becky Oda from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife says that folks can contact her. Um, and her email is becky.ota at wildlife.ca.gov. Um, so there are a couple of questions uh, that are very big picture, kind of touch on the, the whole theme of what you both have discussed, um, having to do with how replicable this process is and what other countries and, and regions can learn from it, and particularly for developing countries that may be more uh, resource limited. So why don't I start there and then Caitlin, you pick up. Um, I would say that there's different pieces of this that are replicable um, and the process components are replicable I think uh, at different scales and in different places though they have to be applied uh, and adjusted to the particular cultural and situational context. Um, I think that we often presume you know I think once sort of win-win and those kinds of notions came into the lexicon in the 1980s that then people presumed that they could actually uh, make that happen. And I think there's actually an extraordinary amount of uh, talent and learning that's needed and able to be applied, whether you're talking about fairly small scale, simple kinds of problems or, or much more larger scale, complicated ones like the MPA process. So I think many of the process lessons are relevant and how they organize different types of groups to interact and make decisions. Um, I think that now that we have collaborative GIS uh, technology that's exportable, that that is also an asset that can be used um, effectively. Um, I, I think that one of the, the, you know, people sometimes say, well, $35 million is a lot of money for a process um, coming from outside. And on, on the surface it is, except, you start breaking that down, you say, well, this was four different processes, so it kind of knocks it down. Much of the investment went into creating tools that then have survived and continue. And I've gone to a lot of restoration conferences uh, in the past couple of years where I see case studies of really small scale projects that cost millions of dollars of infrastructure kinds of change and just moving dirt around, uh, which may or may not have the legacy of this. 
So it, it is a lot of money, but uh, for this, but I think that many of the lessons around process, around structure, uh, can be adapted to other places as long as they are done very carefully around the culture and situational context. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, I think Steve's presentation did a great job of distilling the kind of key themes that are replicable. Um, and then I would also point again towards um, the publications section of the Resources Legacy Fund website, uh, where we have three separate lesson learned documents, one focused on the the design phase, one focused on implementation, and then one focused on monitoring. And those those three documents were created in very, very close partnership with colleagues in Chile and in British Columbia who were specifically interested in this question. What can we learn from California recognizing that we are in a very different environment and have different you know, issues and constraints, but we think there are lessons that are still relevant from California. Um, so I'd encourage folks interested in that to take a look. And, and I would also and highlight- which website are they on? The Resources Legacy Fund website shown here on uh, the slide. So. Great, thank you. And Steve? Yeah, I would just highlight this, this kind of observation about the need to manage the political environment surrounding processes um, is something that often is not recognized by agencies that are kind of running processes or by facilitators running processes. And those processes fail because the uh, of political pushback or a lack of support or whatever. So some of this lesson, and it can be kind of local context, small scale kind of tribal politics or much more larger scale institutional politics is just recognizing the need to manage that interface is something that often is not uh, acknowledged in sort of facilitation process design and administrative procedures and it's necessary. Yeah, thanks. So there are a couple of questions that touch on water quality and other threats um, to marine life. Uh, one from Peru just asking about how the current system addresses water quality issues and another from Sylvia Troost asking how might water quality and other impacts like ocean acidification be addressed in the upcoming review process? So I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, water quality was included as a consideration in the MPA design phase. So there was information that was available to the folks working on, um, you know, trying to decide where to locate the marine protected areas that uh, their water quality data was part of those decisions and consideration. Um, so it was sort of built in on the front end in terms of making sure that there was an awareness of water quality um, issues and implications uh, where you were placing marine protected areas. Um, also, the, the lead water uh, you know, agencies for managing uh, water quality and pollution in the state are part of this uh, coordinated team, the statewide leadership team. So there's a regular opportunity for the agencies that are sort of focused uh, day in and day out on managing the MPAs to coordinate closely with the folks who are focused day in and day out on managing water quality. Um, and that's a great opportunity to, to raise concerns and, and sort of work together, coordinate and try to address problems. Um, as Steve mentioned, you know, California has a whole separate regulatory system that's focused on water quality. So I'd say there's um, significant efforts to sort of integrate those and make sure that they're um, informing each other, but the marine protected area planning process and regulations are not a substitute for the state's existing water quality uh, regulation regime. Um, climate change impacts broadly, including ocean acidification issues, are of keen interest to the state managers um, and something that's being looked at uh, right now. There's a, a, an effort under where there's a special scientific um, advisory team and working group that's focused on those issues with the goal of having their work help to inform this review in 2022. So I think that's certainly an issue that's gonna get a lot more attention in the years ahead. So I know we have to wrap up quickly here. I wanna just note that there were a couple of folks who really ex appreciated the discussion of indigenous communities and how much has been learned through this process and how much remains to be learned. But I want to ask one question in closing. Uh, we've seen recent policy changes that weaken or reduce uh, protected areas in the US. Um, how do you see the processes that you discussed as bolstering MPAs against possible threats to their status and what else can be done? 
Caitlin, I'm going to let you answer that. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but if the question is sort of, you know, are the California MPA is vulnerable to the, you know, same kinds of reductions in protection? Um, I certainly hope not, and I don't think so. I mean, I think the the extent of public process and engagement that went into crafting the MPA network in California, um, and you know, is what led to its success and and its, um, you know, sort of acceptance and embrace by Californians. So I think that the marine protected areas in California have, you know, very very strong support from Californians, um, and poll results will, you know, bear that out. That there's just extraordinarily strong public support for um, ocean conservation in general, and then specifically for the marine protected areas in California. So I, you know, I hope, hope and expect that the marine protected areas um, will stay and hopefully, you know, be improved and over time. Uh, but certainly, you know, I, we've all been surprised by some of the changes that have unfolded over the last few years. So I think, you know, you can't, you can't get complacent. Um, it's also important to keep people involved and engaged um, and make sure that you know the investment is happening in ongoing management, um, so that you know people don't turn to other other issues and priorities, um, putting the marine protected areas at risk. All right. Well, I just want to thank you both for a great session. Uh, lots of thought-provoking ideas. We did not get to every question. We will pass them on to our speakers, and some of the ones that are very specific, you may get some follow-up from the speakers. And I want to thank all of you who joined us, and the recording will be posted tomorrow on the Open Channels website. So uh, thanks, Caitlin and Steve, and all of you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.